My name is Joseph Holzmeier, um, or just Joseph. I go by the Nick Lito II on IRC, also in the, in the Summit IRC, as well as the Yocta Chester, which is like my, my moniker under which I started to do a lot of um, Dr. Project uh, advocacy work, which ended up in doing live codings and organizing this conference with my wonderful co-organizers. And lately, or not so lately, in February, I actually made talking about cool stuff built with Yocto um, my, my living, and I joined Mender as the head of developer relations. And I would like to show you now, at least in slides, not in demo, what we um, do. So, yeah, I already told you, Mender.io, and uh, the product, in, in a nutshell, deploy software updates for Linux devices. And I think the, this, this encamp encompasses two things because we are certainly not the only ones who do updates in a good way. There is a lot of stuff to choose from. from and it's, it's not that we say we, we are the best in each and every case, but we have a couple of features or a, a couple of offerings that the others do not have, whereas the others also have offerings that we do not have. So it's about just telling you, this is what we do. And if it suits your needs, feel free to hit me up. We, we can talk about everything. And if you, if you just like run into the, into the um, challenge of choosing an over-the-air update solution, then um, you know what you're talking about. Because you can't you can make an educated choice if you don't know what it's all about. And if you choose against us for a good reason, then I'm perfectly fine with it. Because no nothing is worse than choosing a product just because you like the name or my nose and then expecting things that are just not there. So it's really about showing on a, on a real down-to-earth developer style what this is all about. Ah, here's, here's my introductory slide. I already told you mo most of it. And I've got one sentence in there which usually tells, tells you whatever I, one can do wrong when, um, when being a developer, I have done it wrong. And in this case, whatever you can do wrong when you're a presenter, I have done wrong. Uh, I broke my demo the day before the demonstration. I'm really re easy to reach both via Twitter and, uh, and mail, plus you will certainly find a way. Okay, so in a nutshell, for over-the-air updates, there's a couple of things that you will want, no matter which system that you are using. And I think the, the first and foremost key requirement is that they are fail-safe, so your device never ends up unusable and bricked. Bricked is like just um, developer slang for it's as useful as a brick, which is super cool if you're intending to build something with bricks and mortar and not super cool if you're trying to make um, an embedded device. So this is one of the absolute key requirements that you should look out for. Does the solution have, um, have some means of mitigating Un, uh, unexpected events, first and foremost, losing power. Along with that goes, whenever you roll out an update, you want those to be atomic and not like have half of a file system updated and half not. Like an inconsistent state that looks like a complete update, but was just half done. Updates should be atomic. When, um, when the when they updates, or um, as we also call them, in, in a like packed way, artifacts arrive. You want to make sure that their, their integrity is valid so that no, no, no unintentional bit flips or something in there over the transmission line or a couple of uh, drop blocks have been, uh, have been done to your artifact as well. Is if you're in a, in a condition or in a, in a, in a product where you want to make sure that nothing runs on the device other than your software, which is actually 
not as often the case as I personally, uh, as you might think, that's my personal opinion, because then you run into a lot of problems with uh, GPLv3, the so-called TVization. You're, you're, um, you're free to Google that. But if you decide to do so, then you want to make sure that the whole chain of the update can verify the signature of, of the artifacts that are involved. This is how we do our um, architecture. The, the key difference to most of the other uh, offerings out there is that we, ca that we call ourselves an end-to-end -end solution, which means um, we are not just um, the, the cloud offering that you, can, that you need to connect to in whatever way you choose, like Hawkbit is, And we are also not just the client that can do all the device magic, uh, like SW Update or Rock. And so we offer like the 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 whole chain from backend, the the artifact server to the client, plus um, a really sophisticated way of managing the um, the backend server. This in, um, involves stuff like um, grouping devices on a, in a dynamical way. So, so you can base your rollouts on, on really changing dynamic things like where a device is located, when was it um, connected the last time, what is this software version. You don't have to manually um, group and, and um, organize all of your fleet. I mean, organizing a fleet of 50 devices is easy. Organizing a fleet of 50K is not that much fun. And once we are an update reaches the device, then we have a device partition layout, which is roughly like that. We'll get to that in a second. But you can already guess it. We, um, we need four partitions, more or less. You can, you can have more partitions. You can have U-boot in, in a non-partition style. It's all possible, but in a nutshell, you want to have four partitions of which two are uh, transient and two are persistent. Because when you roll out an update, you want and you want to achieve the fail-safe um, robustness that I talked about in the beginning, then the common scheme, scheme to use is the AB system flow. And this means you have two partitions that can hold the root file system. And one of those is active. The device runs off this and one is inactive or passive. And this is like the target for the update. Whenever an update is deployed to the device, it gets put onto the inactive partition. The device notifies um, the bootloader environment, does reboot, Uh, after the notification, the bootloader knows, ah, okay, it's time for a partition flip. It flips active versus inactive, boots into the new active partition. And if it reaches full operation again, therefore like um, Manda client comes up again and, and it can notify the backend, then the update is finally committed. Means um, the, the change active, inactive, the flip has been made permanent. If something happens along the way, like the, the update didn't work because of power fail, the update didn't work because of um, you deployed something that actually worked in your case, but not on this one device. So it, it runs into a, a watchdog and reboots somewhere along the way, or that you, that you never can, um, can get back into, into the running client, then the device rolls back because at some point, usually in, a, in an embedded system, your device will run into the watchdog and it, re, it reboots because the, um, the update has not been committed, which means the bootloader has also not been notified of, of, of the commit. It just, when, it did, when the device reboots, the bootloader sees, oh, there was a flip, but it was not committed and it flips back. So the update is not being the uh, being applied, atomic rollback, you end up with the, with the still functional last active partition state. 
I already pointed out in a short way what this means for a partition. You need a bootloader somewhere that can do the flips. We, can, we usually support uh, U-boot and Grub, but technically any custom integration is, is possible. You have to reserve space for two operating system partitions. Plus, you also want some, um, some form of uh, persistent data, which can be one or more partitions. This is for the reason that we treat the A and B partitions as completely transient. You want to do the flips, so you can't have anything on that partitions that you actually like care about or that is valuable to your product. It, it can be gone after the next system update. Yes, we already did that. So this actually means that we need to be able to generate two forms of, um, of artifacts. Once the full images will include the partition layout, the bootloader, and the first initial set of the operating system, plus initial persistent data, we call those um, SD image and UFD image, which has a bit of a historical background, but generally what it means to say is, uh, if it's a SD image, it goes into some form of uh, MMC or flashcard. If it's UFE, then it goes into, uh, into an UFE um, enabled device. Plus, you also want the payload only images that only bring the, bring the um, new operating system image that goes to the inactive partition. And we call those dot mender because you will deploy those usually through the Mender over the air uh, backend. I'm not sure which slide is actually next. Next, I'm not even sure where I put it in that because I actually wanted to point out now that this is, this is actually integrated really deep into the, into the Yocta build project. We are using WIC under the hood. So this, isn't, this is not a, a, a custom magic solution that takes stuff from somewhere else. No, we provide um, an integration layer that is called MetaMender, which has like public, publicly visible all the magic that is, is needed to make those images. We use the standard mechanisms, of course, with some calculations around it to actually figure out how big the, um, the partitions have to be. But this is, this is essential to us. We care about people building their operating systems the way they want and not saying them, okay, you need, you need to run this big stack of base layers and you only need to, uh, or you can only, only stick to this um, distribution. Nope, we encourage people to really make, make their choices and we try to fit in as, flex as, as flexible as possible. And that's why I put this, this slide in here because as we all know, um, configuration data is global and RESDP data is local. Some people of you have uh, chanted along with that, uh, chanted along that with me already. And we also structure the things that go into the update in the same manner. So we encourage people to um, do the modifications that fit a specific device into machine configuration, like um, an overridden machine configuration. We encourage people to add um, the, the API, which in, in this case obviously is um, the Mender client infrastructure to, um, to a distribution. And in the local configuration, we only want to set or only want to see Mender artifact name this is what, what the artifact will, uh, will, will be called in, um, in management, and that's about it. So we really have a clear understanding of how the mechanisms work and how we integrate with them in, um, in the canonical way. So if you have an image recipe and something Mender shows up in there, you're probably on the wrong track because the image recipe, we talked about that in in the live coding session two days ago, the image recipe is about defining how your application looks, not about how your machine or your distribution or your API looks. And we see ourselves as part of your API. 
This is what I already um, outlined in uh, short words. Some, sometimes, um, sometimes you need special modifications. So because the board doesn't match you, the partitions are named in, in arbitrary uh, strings or whatever, then do the machine modifications in an override, in the distro, at, um, at uh, the Mender integration in the way that you want it, and local only set the artifact name. One thing that is special or interesting about the, about the machine configuration, we love Yocto machines so much that we just straight use the uh, machine names from, from uh, Yocto build for identifier strings. So this is what you actually will see in the backend then. Beyond over the air updates, there is a couple of things that we can do, which is um, remote access terminal, which gives you um, uh, like a shell essentially, plus port forwarding and file transfers. We, we can automatically configure devices and we can monitor them in terms of um, he uh, health of the services running or whatever you can like analyze in uh, an automatic way. But, and this is also something that we are pretty proud of, we have, we have uh, a real audit log across that if you are um, in, the, in the position that your customers or your company or your, um, your style of business requires that because you are actually in, in an over-the-air um, environment, you usually work on devices that are somewhere remote. You won't be able to just go there and tinker with them in, ca in case something went wrong. So whenever you roll out something or you do something re via remote access and something goes wrong, and maybe even the, the, the machine is broken after that, then the actual owner of the machine will say, hey, that was you. You just like um, you connected to to this machine and you did something and you you're not, now not telling me, but it was actually you and I want money. And then you can say, no, two things. First, we have really really good audit logs. They lock everything, not only um, artifact uploaded or deleted or deployment and the, and the errors, but each and every keystroke that you even put into a remote terminal, and you. You can literally sit your um, problematic customer in front of the screen and say, this is everything that we did ever to, to your device. If you, can, if you can show us what the problem is, then yeah, it's our blame. And on the same um, notion that I already mentioned a couple of minutes earlier, managing 50 devices is easy. Managing 50K is hard. Managing a million is, is a real challenge. You do not want to, to um, all of your service pe personnel to be able to touch each device or to fulfill um, every um, duty, every service that is in some way ever needed. So you want role-based access control, which is you, ca you can form user groups and give them specific rights across specific groups of devices that they are um, allowed to do. Yeah? I know that you would really, really like to see the demo. And as promised, I cannot do that. Sadly, what I can do and I want to do right now is um, at least give you a really, really, really short tour through the, um, through the interface. So the dashboard, that, um, that gives you the overview. I'm just uh, zooming in a little bit. You can uh, get essentially the health information for your cloud, which, which um, software distributions you are running ac across your fleet, um, how deployments did run, what you tried to roll out, when did it start, when did it end. And this, this is essentially one of my failed attempts to recreate the demo. Your uh, artifacts that you can roll out, 
You can check for device compatibility. I think I don't have um, uh, a device ready for that. But also one thing that is that is pretty cool is the rollout schedule. You can uh, uh, um, roll out in in stages. You can schedule, and you can also add steps. And this is really a crucial thing for in in a lot of industrial and embedded use cases. You you will want to um, you will want to stage things, and not only in 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 the back end. You also will want to have like hooks for the UI on the device. In the worst case, you will want to have somebody in front of the device confirming, yes, it's now safe to deploy an update. We are not in, in production at the moment. We um, There is nobody working on it. Nobody was, will, will get hurt. Once, um, once the update is deployed and the machine shuts down. So we provide really good integrations for all of those things. And as a final thing, I promised you real good integration logs, uh, real, real good audit logs, and one that I did, hopefully, let's look at this. Yep, it, it's a boring session because I was, I was just trying to get things working. Is that one good? No, probably not. Open, open, open. When, when did I have the, the bootloader show? Uh, that one should be good, I hope. Because if I remember correctly, then this is um, this is a demo I did last week. Yeah, exactly. So this was this was a remote um, access session for a demo I did last week, and you can see it's really. This is the proof I connected from remote. I changed the password. So if somebody is now stuck on the machine, they can always blame me. With that, again, if you want to know more about what we do, then get in touch. You can ping me directly. You can um, ping us on GitHub. You can ping us on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, all, all the usual ways. We are really approachable, especially me because I love talking to people. And again, apologies for breaking my demo in a real physical way. And this, this will give me a real um, trouble because recipes are extremely hard to source here at the moment. And as we all know, the Octo project is also pretty accessible. Thanks for your patience and bearing with me failing. Thanks. <laughs>